Hi there, I'm Andrew Greenberg. I'll uh, pretend to be moderator for this session today. Uh, as a moderate moderator as I can possibly be for an activism session. I'm uh, also speaking on the gaming track. I was the original uh, developer of a game called Vampire the Masquerade long, long ago, and I continue to work in game development. I'm the uh, actually the executive director of the Georgia Game Developers Association, and I continue to develop games, so you'll see me over there too. But I like to tell people that games Playing games all day basically funds my ability to do the work I like to do, which is this sort of activism work. I have served on the board of the Georgia Normal Affiliate until just recently. I've been uh, very active with the Green Party here, and I lobby and do other activism work under the, uh, or, or interact with legislators under the Gold Dome on a, a fairly regular basis. And I'll talk about uh, a lot of those different activities as we speak today. And for me, it's been a very interesting journey. I find that for many people, they begin either with a very hyper-local action, there's something very specific to them in their community, and for others, it's a very broad thing that brings them in. When I was in college, it was apartheid and contra funding, which were the things I could rally against, and I've found I get more and more effective the more local I get. So with that, to my left. Hi, I'm Hayden Barnes. I'm an attorney in private practice here in Georgia. Uh, handle mostly complex civil litigation. I'm also staff counsel to the Georgia State Senate uh, Judiciary Committee where I advise uh, members of that committee and other senators on uh, bills that are introduced on technology and policy. I'm also an Electronic Frontier Foundation cooperating attorney um, and a volunteer attorney with Georgia Lawyers uh, for the Arts. Um, I've represented anarchist collectives, NSA employees, uh, fantasy romance novelists, <laughs> Native American Good tribes, um, and healthcare startups. Um, I've been active in politics since I was 15, starting as a congressional volunteer, working my way up to, at 18, uh, county captain for the Howard Dean campaign. That dates me a little bit. Um, I then continued through college and high school, um, and I'm going to talk a lot about uh, balancing um, uh, activation with action um, as we go forward. Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Amy Stepanovich. I am the U.S. Policy Manager and Global Policy Counsel at Access Now, um, which is a global um, civil society organization that focuses on extending and defending the digital rights of users at risk around the world. Um, and we actually, um, I guess, do activism in a lot of different ways. Um, we operate on a four-pronged basis. Um, we have a policy team where I sit on. We have a technology team that, amongst other things, operates a digital security helpline, which provides direct advice and assistance to activists all over the world. We have an advocacy team that actually runs campaigns and does some of the traditional activism um, that you all might be aware of. And we have a sub-granting team where we're able to give funds and other resources to organizations around the world in order to do their own local campaigning so we're not um, trying to come into different countries and put our ideas into their local culture but to promote and support groups where they exist and how they operate. Uh, I'm Dave Moss. I am an investigative researcher at the Electronic Frontier Foundation. Uh, if you're not familiar with us, uh, we are a nonprofit organization based in San Francisco. Uh, we defend civil liberties at the intersection of technology and the law. Uh, I work on various teams at EFF. One of the teams I work on is the state level uh, legislation uh, team and we tend to focus on California because we're based in California. I was involved in helping pass uh, the California Electronic Communications Privacy Act, which Wired called the strongest electronic privacy act in the country, which was a huge multi-year slog. Um, also helped pass a lot of transparency measures around surveillance technology like license plate readers um, and uh, stingrays and open data. Uh, we also, probably more than that, kill a lot of bills. Um, <laughs> legislators like to introduce a lot of legislation that they don't fully necessarily understand the technical implications of and so we come in and make a lot of noise and get our members to make a lot of noise and then those bills get put in a drawer and they never see the light of day again. All right so I usually start sessions with the quick reminder please on uh, vibrator off if you'd be so kind. Uh, second this is both activism 101 and state level activism. So uh, I kind of like interactive panels. We get a lot of feedback from the audience, what they would like to see. 
in this, we can talk very much about the basics of general activism or focus more on local activism. I'm looking forward to this addressing both. But if I get a show of hands, are you more interested in the activism 101 side of this panel? Hands up if that's your big area of interest. All right, and state level activism. Good split down the middle, <laughs> lovely. So we will go ahead and be as schizophrenic as we can throughout this, uh, throughout this panel. One of the things that we had talked about before was talking about how state level activism differs from other activism. As I said, it's very common for people to come in on very high level issues. Black Lives Matter is probably the most successful and uh, effective um, activism group of the past decade. And they're focusing on a very national act, uh, activity and bringing it down to a very focused community level. Uh, and I think this sort of activism shows the effectiveness that groups can have. So if anyone wants to go ahead and run with the idea of what makes state level activism different, go for it. Otherwise, I'll be glad to start ranting about partnerships, alliances, and all those crazy things. Sure. Um, I can start talking about that. So when people try to do activism with Congress, uh, the problem with advocating for Congress is that everyone is mostly in D.C. most of the time. Um, and so the people who get access to them are people who are in D.C. Whereas your state legislature, legislators, uh, oftentimes it's not their full-time job. Uh, oftentimes they still live most of the year in the community that they're in. Uh, so they tend to uh, it tends to be easier to engage them, uh, you know, in town halls, just going to their office. Also, they don't have the the strongest uh, look, stream of lobbyists coming in all the time that you know you would get on the congressional level. So we find that it can be a lot easier to gain access. They listen to you more. Uh, they do like to hear from their constituencies. Oftentimes, they have term limits, which means they need to. Uh, uh, get as much done as they can in, in a few years before moving on to the next office. Um, and there's a lot, uh, uh, Congress has a really strong power of incumbency, which doesn't always carry over to state legislatures, so that does also impact their need to, to get stuff done. And uh, on that note, Congress doesn't always get a lot of stuff done, but <laughs> instead of state legislatures do pass stuff all the time that has a very strong impact on your day-to-day -day life. Yeah, as one of those people who lives in D.C. <laughs> <laughs> nothing, nothing wrong with D.C. <laughs> um, look, federal activism is really, really difficult, um, mostly because you're dealing with 50 states who all have very different interests, and you're trying to get people to come together to have one message. Um, and if you can make an appeal that appeals across at least 26 of those states, you have a chance at winning. Um, but it's not a simple process, and especially in the Congress that we've, we have now and that we've seen over the last few years where nothing is really getting done. And I'm actually, I'll be on a panel later talking about Rule 41 and government hacking. And we've been trying to kill a bill, or not even a bill, a, an amendment to the Federal Rules of Criminal Procedure. And all Congress has to do is pass something that says we're postponing this or we don't want to pass this. Um, but if they do nothing, it's going to go into effect. Um, it's the opposite of what you normally see, where Congress has to do something to change the rules. Here, if they do nothing, the rules change. And they have to act before the 1st of December, and the problem is they're probably not going to, because they can't come together and speak in one voice. On a state level, as Dave said, they're a lot more connected to the community, you get a lot more people listening to you, you have a lot more options. And even if you get out of the legislature out of the state um, lawmaking bodies and you go to the judges and to the administrative agencies, those are also places where you can impact change and they're also a lot more connected to the community and they'll listen to you and they'll take your comments and they actually really care. Um, I used to work at the Department of Environmental Protection in Florida and every time a journalist or somebody wrote a letter to the editor about any of the issues we worked on, we would look at it, we would analyze it, and we try to respond to that person to provide an actual response to the issues that they were raising. So these people are really tuned in <clears throat> to the state communities. One thing I'd also like to add is that uh, politicians are very ambitious animals, <laughs> and they do start usually on the local level, so if you set up a good relationship with the state representative or state senator, eight years later, you might have a really good relationship with the U.S. senator. So I lived and worked in D.C. for four years before I gave up. <laughs> and, um, 
And, you know, you can do really interesting things on the state level. Um, I pulled some examples. Illinois has some very interesting facial recognition privacy legislation. Um, there's the electronic digital privacy that uh, David worked on in California. New York is currently considering a bill that would require uh, software purchases by the state to prioritize open source software. Um, Arizona, Missouri, Delaware um, all have special ebook privacy laws on the books, and 17 states require state agencies to issue their own privacy policies, which is a start. Um, so there's things you can do on the state level that you just can't get through Congress or even through the rulemaking procedures um, in D.C. Um, and that's easily done, more easily done with, like we said, um, representatives who live and work in your community. So as we're going through evil confessions, I too lived in Washington, D.C. <laughs> <laughs> I was a reporter, on, Cap <laughs> I was a reporter yes, on Capitol yes. Hill, and uh, that was right before I started working on Vampire the Masquerade, and you better believe that D.C. politics really fed into the vampire writing we did back in the day. Uh, and, and with apologies to Hayden, I came here to write for a uh, legal affairs newspaper writing about lawyers all the time, and that's why I went and wrote about vampires instead. But uh, one thing that Dave brought up was uh, the ability of lobbyists to really control the message in D.C. Lobbyists have a great deal of power under the state, Alexander the Gold Dome, right? down the street from us here. How many of you are Georgians and are interested in specifically, oh wow, we do have a majority of something. Uh, non <laughs> All right, uh, then I will talk a little bit more about Georgia things, and I hope that other more things, I think it's uh, informative uh, to how a lot of these issues work. Uh, in, uh, so we have uh, one, uh, Mary Margaret Oliver, the senator, right? She, Mary Margaret Oliver from Decatur is the senator, correct? Yes. Yeah, Mary Margaret Oliver is one of our senators here, one of the most long, serving Democratic senators under the Gold Dome. She is uh, particularly, uh, I won't say incensed, but uh, bothered by how heavily the anti-choice activists come down to the Gold Dome on a regular basis and pro-choice <coughs> activists come down there very rarely. And she makes this comment constantly whenever the issues of abortion choice and so forth are raised, that if pro-choice activists want to have any play down at the Gold Dome, they have to be there. It's not just lobbyists who control these messages. It is the fact that they get a steady influx of buses from churches from all over Georgia bringing in people to talk on this issue, and the pro-choice side does not bring them out nearly as effectively. Planned, uh, I believe Planned Parenthood does their activism training now for you know, their citizen lobbyist training to come down to the Gold Dome and learn how to talk to your lobbyists, introduce you to their lobbyists to get this going. But it's very true that on state legislatures that a significant number of um, people coming out to talk will make a big difference, and especially if they come from around the state. The ability to have a voice, to have a voice that's actually effective is really multiplied under the Gold Dome and it goes up by every single individual you can bring out. And one of the things I go on that is really important for state level success is alliances. And I hate when I see people who say, we're very hard for our, our, our message, we're not going to bring other folks into it. I don't find them very effective. I find that good intentions do not necessarily lead to good results. It is that ability to build a broad level of support. So for me, if you're going to be an activist under the Gold Dome, I find it a lot less effective to be a solitary single activist pushing your message. You need to do that if no one else is. Absolutely be under the, under the, at the legislature doing that. But start building those alliances. So those are one, the first tip, and what I consider the primary tip for success. I would like to pass that on to the left. What do you consider important for success at state level? Um, I definitely think that making those connections and actually going out and talking to people, and we see that at all levels. Um, we bring people up to DC and they are shocked that they can walk into their representative's office, into their senator's office. So you don't have to have an appointment, you can just walk in and speak to somebody. And they don't realize how open that system is. And that works on the state level as well. Um, these people want to hear from you, and that is so important to get out and get that word and like to tell them how you feel and to show support for what you're either supporting or opposing. And I think Dave had a really good point at the front. This is not only about supporting things, it's also about making sure that bad provisions don't go into effect. Um, New York and California recently tried to pass laws that said that you couldn't sell 
um, encrypted devices within their states. So basically, they were going to make Apple stores illegal in New York. <laughs> Um, and they, they, they had a lot of support. The police chiefs were in support of this. They didn't want these devices in their states. Um, so New Jersey was really excited because New Jersey was about to get a lot of iPhone business. Um, <laughs> New York not so much and New Yorkers weren't so much. And so it was people communicating that they didn't want that to go forward that was able to, to kind of shelve these bills and get them put in that big dark cabinet. Yeah, uh, oftentimes legislative staffers will have a formula of what they consider one phone call and how many people that actually represents. Um, in California, we've had legislators tell us that if they get five phone calls on an issue, that raises it up like two notches on their priority scale. Now, they maybe don't agree with it, but then they know that's something they actually need to dedicate resources to work on. Um, you know, we have a whole variety of tools that we use to contact legislators. We have an, uh, an email system that allows people to just plug in their, their zip code and their address and they'll tell them who their legislator is and there's like a form email that they can adjust and that goes to them. And we'll, we'll, we'll blast legislators that way. We have call tools when things are really urgent where people can just hit a button and it calls the legislator, gives you a script of what to say. We do Twitter campaigns, that helps. But, you know, that's a lot of stuff involving engagement, but there's a few, like, really crucial steps that are very, very small that are actually very important. You know, for example, with a piece of legislation, it's always important to get a letter in that just says, to the author, says, no on this, yes on this. You, even if you don't put an explanation in, you know, the point is, is that they'll, everybody will be handed this analysis when they're in committee and it'll say who's opposed and who's supported. And if there's nobody on the opposed list or there's nobody on the supported list, uh, you know, either one, if it's balanced in one way or another, then that's just going to either move through quickly or move not, you know, through less quickly. Um, and there's, there's various other steps down the way. I think that one of the things that's interesting about state legislatures is that there tends to also be a, a good public comment period during committees where you can line up a whole bunch of people and each person gets a certain number of minutes to make their case and that forces your policymakers to actually listen to you in that context. And each of these all sort of add up to fueling a debate. And I think that with a lot of these issues, if people, the more people think about them, the more they come to the same conclusion as you. It's just when people don't think about them that they make bad decisions. And so the more you engage them, the more they think about it, and then the more likely they are to uh, agree with you in the end. So thank you for all those automated phone calls, by the way. <laughs> I do appreciate those. Um, I do answer those, and we do keep tallies. But I want to talk, uh, build uh, on many things people have just said, um, and it's, that people who show up get what they want. Um, and you you have to have a balance between activation and action. So when I talk about activation, I mean things like social media, newspaper editorials, uh, rallies outside the state capitol, um, or packing a public meeting or here. Those are great things that get people activated. Uh, they uh, educate people on the issues. It shows they carry weight. But that has to translate into action, concrete action. That includes lobbying your senators one-to-one, -one, um, attending those committee meetings, which are an excellent opportunity to um, discuss problems of pending litigation, propose changes to litigation before uh, litigation legislation, um, developing model legislation, which is something that I believe EFF does and several other uh, organizations do, uh, building organizational coalitions, um, You'd be surprised what kind of coalitions you can build um, in, in states that might not make much sense, uh, like bringing um, certain, I'm trying to think of a good example. Um, but you can bring uh, people who are concerned about the size of government together with people concerned about um, uh, abuses of that government. So, you know, there's a strong uh, balance there um, that you can build on. Um, and the other thing, of course, is bringing strategic litigation, which I bring up because I'm a lawyer. Um, <laughs> um, and um, but in terms of lobbying, you know, you can walk, in, you can come in the state legislature, and you can come in, and if the senator's there, you know, and he's got time, he'll talk to you for 10, 15 minutes, and you know, you could go office to office and do that. And if you're his constituent or her constituent, she'll try and make time, even if she doesn't have the time. Uh, but uh, this brings up a few interesting points on how you can get involved in the process. A lot of what we've been talking about so far has been reactive. 
for instance, uh, folks jumping uh, when the RIFRA legislation came in. George, those of you who aren't Georgians, this was the, um, the last anti-gay bill to show up before the legislature passed legislature. The governor vetoed it. Uh, in contrast, what happened in North Carolina with the transgender bathroom bill. And that's much more than just transgender bathrooms. It's a lot in the North Carolina bill where that one is the law of land and it's been hurting business up there uh, accordingly. But there are, on the flip side of the reactive issues, RIFRA being the big Georgia issues, are also the proactive ones where the citizenry really does, and the activists specifically, come up with what do we want to see change in the state. Medical marijuana and uh, same drug policy have been the big ones in Georgia recently where there are a number of different groups uh, Peachtree Normal, Georgia Care, uh, the, the, all, the med all the families who have the medical issues and more have created a strong coalition that brought an issue that legislators generally don't talk about and have had both Republicans and Democrats introducing legislation to address what is a very real issue. And that came about purely because these groups were very active, and especially the families. The families really led the charge on that with a great deal of support from their partners within the coalition. So one of the things I often recommend to people is to look at what you want to do. Do you want to focus on reactive? Do you want to focus on being proactive on a cause? Find what matters to you. Don't try and bite off everything. Now we're getting into activism 101. If you start spreading yourself too thin, almost nothing gets done. So you really do want to focus on what matters to you and what you believe you can do effectively. They've talked about all these places to get involved, from the writing of the bill, to the committee hearings, to the actual uh, votes before the full bodies of the state legislature and more. There are lots of places to get involved. It can be tricky to find that information. Uh, some of those things will suddenly appear on a door a few minutes before a committee hearing on that topic. So it, part of the reason you want those alliances is there are people who are down under at your state legislature every day and if they know you care about uh, gay rights, uh, LGBT rights, if you care about uh, medical marijuana, same drug policy, etc., they'll keep an eye out and will give you a call when they suddenly see something appear and you can make things happen accordingly. Um, so that's the next tip I was going to say is really try and focus on what matters to you. Look at what you can do and what you care about and tie those together. There's one piece of advice I always want to give activists. And what the number one error I see um, are people who like to take things that they think are happening or things that they think are going on and cite them as facts. And then cite them to lawmakers as this is a thing. Um, or they presuppose something. And so actually when you write something or send something, citations are your number one friend. And actually stating what facts you have and why you're supporting something and where you're getting those facts will get you infinitely further. Um, and it's something that we have to communicate to people all of the time, is that you can't just say, you have to do this because I have concerns, or you have to do this because this horrible thing could happen. It's look at these numbers or look at this um, news article or look at this report. Um, this is why I want you to take X action or not take X action. And that is something that people really tune into because when they have to justify, because on the other side, um, the people that you're talking to represent a lot of people and they have to justify their actions to everybody else that they represent. And if they have real solid facts and evidence to make those justifications, they're going to be so much more likely and more able to kind of side with you and to make the votes and make the decisions that you really want them to make. Um, and the other piece, how many people have actually walked into a congressional office before and had a conversation? How many people follow their representatives or senators on Facebook or Twitter and have commented or responded to them? So. When you don't want to walk into a building, because these buildings, like, I stare at the Capitol building all day, that big white dome, and it's super intimidating. It's just like hard to be like, oh yeah, I'm gonna walk in there and I'm gonna tell you what I think now. <laughs> um, but like writing in print and writing letters and writing things where you can sit down with your thoughts for a couple hours and put something on paper or write a comment with a citation, um, that's a little less intimidating. So that's the other piece of that is, to use where you feel strongest. If you feel strong walking in and having a sit down meeting and staring somebody in the face, do that, because that's really effective. If you feel strong having a phone call, 
that's great. But if you, you don't feel like that's your strength and you want to write a letter, they'll listen to that as well. And so use all of the resources that you have available to you and use the one that you feel most comfortable using. Um, because that's where you're really going to shine is where you're comfortable. Um, so on the, the proactive note, uh, if you do have an idea for um, uh, a piece of legislation, you know, the first person you're going to want to look at is your, you know, your direct representative. Uh, but you might want to do a little bit of research, maybe call up a reporter to figure out how popular your legislator is with his peers. Because if you do have a legislator who has irritated everyone, <laughs> chances are if they introduce a bill, it's just going to get ignored. And so you may need to go to another of your representatives or go to a representative that you know is interested on the issues who maybe doesn't directly represent you. Um, or a, sort of another sort of activism 101 thing, kind of going back to reactive. Um, there's a, a spectrum of, when you're taking a position or you're deciding a position, there's like a spectrum of positions that you can take. Kind of like in Dungeons and Dragons, you would have like chaotic good and neutral and chaotic evil and then moving down, there would be opposed and then there would be opposed unless amended and then there's neutral and then there's support. And it's not, those are something that you can wield for leverage with legislators, start off with oppose, then move to oppose unless amended, and then say if you do this, I'll go to neutral, or if you do this, I'll go to support. But you also have to look at other associations that there are people who might have been opposed, and if you can work with them to get them to neutral, then you've got a lot of power. For us, with some of our law enforcement bills, we know the district attorney's associations are never going to get on board. We know the cops are never going to get on board. But if we work with them to a certain extent, maybe we can get them to neutral. And if we get them to neutral, sometimes that's as good as having them supported. Yeah, and in Georgia, this is certainly an important one. The uh, sheriffs uh, are, are a big lobbying group, uh, the municipal association of life. That's been a big part of the debate on medical marijuana, and same drug policy, and so on. And finding ways to get uh, everyone involved to create at least a better place than where we are now is a, an important part for an activist. You can't, I, it is my opinion, you can't always just say we're going to win 100% or nothing. You can take those incremental steps and get to real success. I have to say, it is kind of frustrating when you're dealing with legislatures and you realize that your government is actively lobbying against you, that you have, <laughs> you're paying the salaries of sheriffs and these sheriffs maybe have an association that they pay dues to, perhaps with tax, do tax dollars, and then those associations lobby, and then there's the unions who go and lobby. And so it's kind of hard to find yourself at odds with the people who are serving you and they're lobbying on their interests, not necessarily on the interests of the greater public. So I want to give an example from this last session, um, talking about activation and action. Um, this is more specific on the state level, of course. Um, and about having you know, reaction and a sustained presence. Um, so this session, there was a bill introduced that um, legalized campus carry uh, in Georgia. That's the right to conceal uh, weapons um, on college campuses. Um, it was a very heated debate. It came through our committee. And um, the Moms Demand Action uh, organization in every town packed those hearings. Um, but the bill still passed. And that's, you know, we partly have to learn from the people who do this very well, people like the NRA. They have a sustained presence. They've developed those relationships over time. And just showing up you know, having those automated phone calls, um, <coughs> packing hearings, um, marching out front is fine, but you need the back end to support it as well. No, I think that's a great uh, analysis. Another group that was uh, successful this time around was, again, Black Lives Matter. Locally here, we think of them as a local group, but in Georgia there's a policy that police officers who are accused of shootings are allowed to testify before the grand juries, different from other grand jury proceedings. And they've raised this as an issue where suddenly, even in the face of opposition police, this can disappear. So they, it can be uh, an amazingly effective journey. All right, we're starting to see questions. I was going to start transitioning us into the activism 101, so let's grab some questions now and then start moving. That's a lot of questions already. All right. Okay. We're going to stop around the mic. <laughs> work? Yep. <laughs> hey, um, so I'm a, I'm a programmer uh, here in Atlanta, and I'm, I'm hoping this is appropriate. I, I started a website called free to vote at US that uh, it's because I've seen so many people dis disturbed in this election by their choices between you know, Hillary and Trump. 
And the whole point of it is to, uh, is to match up Republicans with Democrats and free them both to get to vote for a third party. So there's no spoiler effect. And uh, we're kind of having trouble getting traction with uh, getting, people, getting people interested. And I'm wondering if you guys have any suggestions for that, or are we thinking too big? Or you know, what's, what's the best way to do something on a national level that seems, you know, it seems incredibly important based on all the news I've been seeing, but it's not, you know, we, we haven't really caught on that well. Activism's a long haul. Yeah, and one of the big issues I was gonna talk about under Activism 101 is avoiding burnout. Because there can definitely be times when you think you are definitely crying into an empty room and nothing is happening. Uh, and I think this is true pretty much of every activist group at some point or another. Uh, the question is, for me, how long are you willing to stick it out and what sort of efforts are you gonna make to get the word going? It's not gonna, it's not, Unless you get some sort of viral sensation kitty cat photo to go, uh, or J uh, GIF to go with it, you're kind of going to be taking a long time to build it up. How long are you willing to do that, and how hard will it hurt you to do that, and how loud are you willing to keep, to keep yelling? Uh, again, it's the partnerships who will come out and show this. The Libertarian Party is very active in Georgia. There is a Georgia Green Party. Both of these groups have been effective in, in some ways, less effective in others. Uh, but they do have partnerships with other groups they can reach out to. I don't know if you've been in touch with either of them, but certainly locally and then nationally, they're both uh, strong. So there's a, there's a in line with um, what Andrew said, there's a quote from an activist named Ann Braden, who was a racial justice activist in Kentucky many, many, many years ago. Um, and she used to say that you have to know what cathedral you're building when you put your stone in. And I think that's, it, it's what I reflect on quite a bit when I feel like I'm not making headway and it's like you have this huge thing that you're moving toward and you're going to get to put this one thing in and how can you do that best? Um, the piece of advice I would give is talk to journalists as much as possible and start local. Um, they're willing to follow stories, they wanna know what's happening and so the best way to get into the news is actually to talk to the people who are writing the news and so start at the local level and then see if you can leverage that up and that's true with any campaign that any of you are running. Um, Journalists are great resources, and they have a really good eagle-eye view of what's happening. And especially in an election year, to have a story about election politics. Um. And there's a very famous quote, which I think always bears uh, reiterating, which is, uh, at first they'll ignore you, then they'll <laughs> laugh at you, then they'll attack you, and then they'll claim it was their idea all along. <laughs> so you're stage one, you got three more. Thankfully, there are not 10 stages of grief involved in this, too. So just uh, keep going on it. A couple more questions, then we'll jump back into a few other topics. Hi. Um, my question is money. <laughs> <laughs> so um, how, how is it used? Is it even something that's possible to use at a kind of a grassroots level? I think there are plenty. If you have cash to put into a, into a movement or an activism campaign, you, you, it's one of the key ingredients right up there with people and time and expertise. Uh, one of the things they can do you is you can hire a lobbyist down there. And uh, they are in a very effective kind of for getting information, getting you into doors, and so on. Uh, advertising on a website that talks about how to get people to vote in new ways is certainly an option too. I mean, uh, are you asking more how to spend it or how to get it? How to spend it. Hey, come up here, we'll talk after this. <laughs> uh, I think uh, it really depends on your focus. I think you want to look at three different areas in particular. One is building your core group. What sort of resources does it take? I mean, uh, there are so many meetup groups where people are buying drinks for everyone who shows up to get them involved in it. Two is expanding your reach, hiring a lobbyist, getting media uh, going along. And three is building an infrastructure for yourself. Can you hire people to reduce the chance that they're going to burn out? Um, I mean, certainly you could hire a lobbyist, uh, you know, some things that can be, I mean, you can always donate to a candidate and maybe that'll get you in a banquet that you can corner them and buttonhole them and get stuff out of them. Uh, something that we find useful from time to time, and I don't know that we spend money on it, but maybe other people spend more money on it, is setting up like, you know, renting a space, throwing a brown bag lunch, throwing a coffee hour where people come and it's supposed to be an uh, educational briefing where maybe they send staffers and you, you know, 
explain all the issues and they answer all the questions that they might have. And you know that might not be a whole lot to rent out a space. Um, depending on your local rules, you may not be able to give them coffee or food or not. I think it just depends on the state, right? Yeah. <laughs> no, you can rent out space in the Georgia Dome. Yeah, and host dinner. Uh, it's great. It's really nice. You can put on a whole day at the Georgia Dome. You got to get your uh, stuff in quickly. We did a whole digital media day at the Gold Dome a couple of years ago. It was very effective for letting people know about uh, digital entertainment, digital media, game development, and so on in yep. Georgia. I mean, one thing I always like to look at is, you know, there's two, a lot of states have two different kinds of disclosures you can look at. On one, you can look at their campaign finance, who's donating to them. On the other, you can look at who's, how much people are paying lobbyists, and oftentimes that will have what kind of gifts they're giving to staffers. I always like looking at California and seeing how many people got free tickets to Disneyland, um, <laughs> which is quite scary. That's why Disney has a lot of, you know, you know, uh, power at the Capitol. Um, you know, other ways that I see people spend money, which I would never do, is something called behested payments, where you might donate to a legislator's uh, charity. If church. Yeah. Uh, I think that's kind of, it makes me kind of, you know, uh, shiver a little bit, but those are things that do happen. And don't ignore the judiciary. Um, this is another thing I like to say. You have people who are making so much law in this country, and this is an electronic trap. Judges in this country are woefully undereducated on technology. They don't know what they're doing. They don't know what it is. They don't use the internet. What is the internet? Uh, um, providing CLEs, providing training for judges and their staff members to educate them on these key issues that are they're going to be deciding down the road um, is just something that's under-resourced, underfunded, underdone. Um, and providing those resources will help you in the long run because these are the people who are going to be interpreting the laws that get passed for a very long time. CLA? Uh, continuing legal education, it's something that judges and attorneys and anybody with a law license has to, has to do. One thing I forgot to mention was the value of general interest educational events, general public educational events. So one of the things I do on, on Saturday here in this room is the 10 rules of dealing with police encounters. Doing the what, 15 years now? God, at least a decade. Well, it was something else before that. Oh, that's right, that's right. So anyway, so we've been doing this for a long time, and I started doing them here because I was doing them more generally as outreach for Georgia Normal. And uh, it has been a very effective way to get interest, get people knowledgeable, not just disseminate information, but get people more involved and help activate more people down the line. So I'd recommend that as using resources as well. I mean, but using resources to bus people in from around the state, like, yeah. I feel like that is a, a golden thing to do. The question, the question I have is something that you did bring up uh, for regulations that, uh, at least at the federal level, they have to go through the APA with a notice and comment period. Is that just an ineffective method of, of activism, or? It, it, it's very effective. Um, Regulations.gov. Um, you know, when when Congress passes a bill, they leave a lot of the details to the agencies. And the agencies fill those out um, over the coming months and years, and those get uh, posted in the Federal Register. And there's uh, a notice and comment period. When um, the administration follows the APA, it can be very useful. Um, and there are often notice and comment periods at a state and local level as well, and those those can be useful. I think you want to. Yeah, I, so there are two different types of things that you can provide comment on. Um, so DC loves acronyms. I'm going to apologize in advance. There are requests for comments, which are called RFCs, and there are notices of proposed rulemakings, which are NPRMs. And at the request for comment stage, agencies really want feedback. They want to know what you think. They're trying to figure out there's this thing and we need to deal with it, and how do we get feedback? Um, at the notice of proposed rulemaking stage, it's a little bit harder. At that stage, the agency kind of knows what it wants to do, and they kind of know what they're going to do, and so it's harder to get them to change their mind. What providing a comment does do is it gives legal standing if you want to challenge that rule eventually in a court. Um, so we talked about using litigation as a strategy. You can do that that way. Um, providing, so we actually recently went through this process with the Bureau of Customs and Border Protection, um, who runs the border crossings in the United States. They wanted to amend 
the customs form that you fill out when you enter the country to ask for your social media information and to ask for your like Twitter profile, your Twitter handle. And they were going to make it voluntary, but for people who were trying to get into the country, it wasn't going to seem voluntary. And they were going to scan all of that information and analyze it somehow and make a judgment call about whether or not you could be let in. Um, and so it was a really complicated process. What we did was we actually built a survey where we asked people to fill out answers to 12 different questions. And we submitted almost, I want to say, a thousand plus comments um, that people filled out the survey and left comments at the end. And we were able to file those individually. And that's a really loud voice that you can speak with by doing something easy. So again, almost getting back to money, building those tools and getting the word out that a lot of people need to comment um, can be really powerful. I'll give you two specific, one a state and one a local example. The state one is from yesterday. I also serve on the board of the Atlanta Regional Commission's workforce group, where basically oversees million, tens of millions of dollars in training, or millions of dollars in training to get, create a more better educated, better trained, better compensated workforce in the region. And we just put out uh, the next year's strategy, actually strategy is going to 2020, uh, for 30 days comment. Unfortunately, there's so I put out two different documents, each got one comment, but each of those comments were addressed, were dealt with uh, immediately. And uh, I, I think it's very true, whether you're inundating them or it's just you, <coughs> these get looked at and they are concerned that if they don't address them, that activist will come out to it. And often you are raising a concern that either they hadn't prioritized or hadn't realized. So it can be a good thing to do. I just wish there was someone who aggregated all of these different regs that are out there to one website you just scroll through, oh, I care about this one, I don't care about that one, et cetera. Uh, another one, uh, I'm very active in my county, DeKalb County here, and I remember being at one county commission meeting, a woman stood up to talk about an issue she was having with the police and the, um, the chief assistant to the, to the county CEO brought over the police chief, had them come out, and they dealt with it right there. So these sorts of things do happen if you raise your voice. Next question. Can you talk about um, avoiding burnout and staying in it for the long term for those of us who don't have a lot of free time? Uh, sure, I'll jump on that one. I think that one is absolutely critical. It's so hard to avoid burnout. I've seen so many people come and go from these people who are really passionate and committed and just couldn't make a go of it. Uh, I hate to say one of them, which is don't set your hopes too high. If you go in thinking it's going to change the world within the next year and it's going to be your efforts that will make the difference, you will hit that wall really quickly. Uh, the one thing I will say is look for those small victories. Wait, hey, work toward them and when you see them, take great pleasure in them. Uh, if you can get paid doing it, that's even better. But for many activists, that's never going to be the case or if it will, it'll never compensate you for the time you actually put in. So I'll say be realistic, be motivated, and take pride in what you do. I think that is right on. Um, the small victories are important. And know when, you're, when you can get a small victory. Sometimes you want to push harder and get everything. And so we actually saw this in DC with the USA Freedom Act fight. I don't know if any of you are aware of that. But last year, we got the first bill passed to reign in the NSA in decades. Um, but it didn't go far enough for a lot of people, and a lot of people were really mad about it. Um, but when it finally passed, it actually did, it reined in a lot of their activities that they were performing and allowed them to, or required them to stop the bulk collection of phone records that they were doing in the United States. And that's a, that's a victory, even though you didn't get every single thing you wanted. Um, so it's easy to look at that as a defeat, like this bill passed and I opposed it and I wanted more. But then again, you, you won something. And so know the difference between a defeat and a small victory. Next question. This is more of a comment than a question. Um, one of the easiest ways to get grassroots advocacy is to remind the people that are like-minded to actually vote. Especially, <laughs> in, no, I mean, we have under 20% of, of qualified voters actually going out and vote. And if our elected representatives know that you're a voter, then your comments carry a little more weight. My second comment to this is if you're going to build those relationships, especially at local and state levels, do it when things are not in session. Georgia legislature only meets January through April-ish. Call them out to your events. They love photo ops. Get those relationships going. And the reason, 
Oh, what, one more. The third thing is with letter writing. Sometimes if you can come up with something that's a little catchier, it makes a big difference. I've been advocating PTA and wonder we wanted to say my school nurses. So we had all of our PTA members send in tongue depressors with how many times their kids had seen the school nurse. We got calls at PTA from legislative offices saying, please tell them to stop sending. <laughs> <laughs> they got like 10,000 tongue depressors. Like and that the was- point has been gotten across. <laughs> the, the nurses were saved that year. They were low hanging fruit on the budget. But you know, if you can come up with a, a catch, it might help. Yeah, and with, um, with uh, the California Electronic Communications Privacy Act, when that got to the governor, uh, we in the ACLU had printed out the you know thousands upon thousands of signatures on a dot matrix printer. <laughs> and it was just huge, and we rolled that up and dropped that off the governor's office. <laughs> Our colleagues in the EU, when they were threatening the internet, had people send fax machines to members of the European Parliament, faxes to members of the European Parliament, and so they've had like, pages coming out of their fax machines, which is this device they never they were like, what is this beeping noise? And you know how loud fax machines are? Um, it really got the point across. The reason I laugh when you talk about voting, my daughter is now 15 months old, but in her first year of life, she voted five times in local, state, and national. That means I held her and pressed the buttons I want her to vote. Uh, I don't have her with a voter ID card, not yet. Wait till tomorrow. But we had five elections in my community, two were cityhood ones for Tucker where I live. There were primaries, there were statewide votes. She voted five times, and activist friends of mine tell me they have not voted that many times in their lives. People who are involved have said that I've not voted that many times. So it's not just for activists to get out and vote, but it's also for activists to drag their friends to the polls. Go ahead of time, everybody's got early voting now. And do those votings, just get in the habit. Every single vote, it's easier and easier to get educated on the issues, and you can go ahead and it really does make that difference. When your community's voting, your community gets listened to. In back. Hi, so um, we talk about relationships, and building relationships with people, legislators and whatnot, but uh, I think it was the lawyer who brought up the issue with the NRA. So how does, you know, even if you have a good relationship, how do you combat those organizations that are literally pumping millions of dollars into, you know, the, the uh, donation, like, you know, churches or whatever the case may be of these representatives to meet their own interests. Good ideas do make it through, and sometimes it can take a few years without a powerful lobbyist, but if you have a persuasive argument and facts to back it up, it can take time, but you can break through. and. Um, all, all that money buys are lobbyists who are already friends with the um, legislators, but friendships are free, um, and you can develop those too. Um, you know, you won't be able to spend you know three months on there, but you know you have the rest of the year too. So it can, it's it's an uphill battle, but it can be overcome, and I've seen it overcome. Be loud, have facts. They have to justify these votes again. Um, they can't justify and say, I got a lot of money from the NRA. You're not gonna see that in a news story. Um, back up what you're saying if you can get them. And, and also, the NRA is still this faceless monolith that's three letters, there's not, there's not people. Um, I mean, there's people who work there, but what I'm saying is that personal stories do help. If you have, uh, I mean, I think that, I mean, I, we're not a gun rights organization, so I'm just kind of like out here, but I mean, having people talk about their own experiences are going to resonate in a way that you know an organization just saying we're the NRA and we say no is going to do it. But not taking a position on the NRA or anything. Else. But gun rights activists are a great group to look at for how to operate. They stay involved and they are involved constantly. I think uh, there's a decent amount, I should say decent, there's some money on the gun safety side as well, perhaps not as much on the gun rights side, uh, but I would and they have got, there's incredibly compelling stories on that side, but the gun rights activists are there all the time. Maybe I'm just looking at Georgia, but it is a constant, constant thing. And that level of activism is something people should really take a look at. Look at the groups that are being effective. The NRA itself is a monolithic thing, but the activists are there all the time, and their human faces there all the time. We are uh, at our 10 minutes. One more question, and then we'll take last comments from the panel. Uh, so, 
I wanted to say first thank you everyone here who does a lot of amazing activism work. Uh, but I wanted to actually come at this from the other side of the equation. So if I was someone who is a more, let's say, normal citizen, or in my case, spends most of my life on a plane not, not going anywhere that's interesting, um, how would I stay informed and participate in a way that is as active as possible and, you know, being, being good and, and engaged and stuff? What would you recommend for me staying informed and, and doing the things, aside from playing to my strengths, like uh, letter writing or calling or some of those more effective things? So uh, when I first was getting uh, involved, I took a, a tact from a political science professor I'd had who said that he made sure he got mailings from everybody. He got mailings from the farthest right, the farthest left, and everybody in between. And I get those uh, on my email now whether I want them or not. And they're from all <laughs> over the place. And uh, the, the headlines are blaring. The subject lines will grab you quickly, and you'll want to trash many of them. But everything is popping up on those. Whatever the cause of the moment is, someone is trying to raise money off of it. And they will hit you up for those bucks. And you will see quickly what the cause celeb of that 15 minutes is going to be. Uh, I have an email account set up to, for the spam that I'll look at, like that kind of stuff. It's not my main account by any means, but it is actually an AOL account. Uh, but I look at it, I review it regularly, and I look at the stuff that's coming in to see what is hot, what's mattering to people, and what's probably going to be the next cause to, and to just at least be informed if not involved with. I can't believe how easy it is now to be informed on these things. Yeah, have, it, have it fit into your life. I think that is another, like, don't try to fit yourself into activism. Have activism fit into what you do. Uh, because then you'll keep it up and you'll have that steady drumbeat. So if you're on Facebook, follow your representatives on Facebook. Follow the people who are running against your representatives on Facebook and get the other side of things. Don't just like buy into their own narrative. Um, if you're on Twitter, do it there. If you're on any other social media, if you use your email and you're a really good email user, sign up for their newsletters. Um, but if you're somebody who deletes junk email when it hits your inbox and you know you never open those things, don't sign up for all of the newsletters because you're not going to read them. You're not going to change that part of you. Um, do something that you're actually going to see and be educated on, because otherwise, why? Uh, I second the social media following of your legislators and policy makers. EFF does have a mailing list and an app that can help you out, <laughs> EFF.org. Um, but uh, yeah, I think that also, uh, one thing that's always helped me is, you know, any given state is going to have a crew of really insider blogger ga gadflies that aren't you know necessarily writing for a major newspaper or anything like that but they may know everything that's going on because they're writing a blog for other lobbyists and they're just out there so yeah. i'll actually throw out one secret that's helped me a lot on this and this is the personal connections when you first get involved in activism keep an eye out for the people who are actually doing the work and are actually sane and keep in touch with them follow them and one thing I have done over the years is even causes I didn't particularly care about because people I knew were good and committed were doing them. I helped them out, I supported them, and they in turn supported mine. This is what I talked about with that relationship building, that big network you're building. Really focus on good people within the activism communities with whom you can work and stay in touch with them. So don't just expect them to follow you. You need to work with them, too, to get their goals done and help them along the way. And it is that perfect example of a rising tide will raise all boats. Uh, all right, what I wanted to do, and I should have said this before, is one last tip, and I think you just gave a really good one. I've got, I've got one last tip. Okay, one. all right, so if everyone wants to throw out one last tip for activists. All right, so you don't just have to be a passive activist or just an activist on the outside. If you go to your county's website, if you go to your city's website, there's going to be scores of boards and commissions that have vacant seats, that there's just nobody to sit on these commissions. I got on locally in San Francisco, the San Francisco Sunshine Ordinance Task Force, which does transparency issues. But there's just a huge, huge list, and it's not hard to get on there and then suddenly have a much bigger impact because you're able to call hearings, you're able to get people to come before you, and you're able to actually write policy for your local government as essentially a volunteer policymaker. 
Um, I, I mean, it's mostly just echoing Andrew, but get involved with the groups who are already involved. Um, like I started, where we work internationally, but we're not, we have 10 offices in 10 countries. That is a very small portion of the world. And when something happens in a country where we don't have an office, we need to contact the local people. Um, know who's present, know who's working on the issues, and know that there's a history there that you're probably never going to know all of. Every issue comes with baggage. Every topic that you want to work on comes with baggage. Um, and some people know that. You can tap into that expertise and you can learn from the people who are there already. Read the news, but don't believe any of it. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, so stay involved, you know, talk to people, listen to people. There are people who've been doing, maybe have been doing your, you know, this idea, your cause for a long time. They may be able to identify an area of opportunity to move into that would be willing to mentor you through. Um, or you could jump on what they have. Um, but uh, keep your ear to the ground. And you never have, a, you never know when these skills are going to help you. And I've got a, an example from this week again. There's a development in my neighborhood. Neighbors call me because there's suddenly significant erosion running into a creek in our area. We reached out to the county and now that development's got a stop work order on them until they clean up the creek and block off any further erosion. <laughs> These things will pop up when you least expect them. My experience is the people who are least involved in politics are the ones who are most hurt by the political system. It's those folks who are active who actually make sure that it supports their life. Politics is just about aggregating human resources for specific goals, and it's up to us to direct that, that really strong force in the direction we want it to go. It's up to all of us to make it work the way we want it to. So join us, uh, join me uh, Saturday, 8.30. Is it on this? <laughs> it's on this. Wait a minute. Join me Saturday at, uh, Sunday at 8.30. Ten rules for dealing with police encounters. And we'll talk about the police side of this equation. And I also have handouts of uh, all the panels that Amy and I, Kurt, who also works at EFF, uh, are going to be on this weekend. So if you want one, I got it. Thank you all very much for joining us. Yeah. Yeah.